Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barton, Washington. Today is Thursday, April 6th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The world continues to react to the indictment and arraignment of former U.S. President Donald Trump. Whether you are a president, whether you are an influential person in the society, law is law. So if Donald Trump broke the law at one point in his life, I believe that he has to pay for his wrongdoings. The U.S. dollar gains ground in South Sudan. South Africa ends electricity state of disaster. A former deputy secretary of Zambia's opposition party is released from prison. Senegal's opposition says it is open for dialogue with President Macky Sall, but with two conditions. Voters in Liberia demand an extension of the first phase of voter registration. This is intended to make sure, to make up for the delays and technical problems that have led to the many not being able to register. And women are set to dominate Sudan's archaeological field. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The world continues to react to the indictment and arraignment of former U.S. President Donald Trump. Trump pleaded not guilty on Tuesday in a New York state court to a 34-count indictment. It accuses him of falsifying business records linked to a 2016 hush money payment to an adult film actor in the first ever criminal case against a current or former U.S. president. Trump, who is seeking the Republican Party nomination in the 2024 presidential election, also faces other criminal investigations besides the New York indictment. Here are some reactions from South Africa. Nobody is above the law. Whether you are a president, whether you are an influential person in the society, law is law. So if Donald Trump broke the law at one point in his life, I believe that he has to pay for his wrongdoings. I don't think that this hush money payment is something that's worth a criminal case or um, criminal prosecution. Just pleading to a minor misdemeanor would be fine. I feel like it's been blown out of proportion and it feels very politically motivated. And I think the Democrats on the left wing, they're trying by all means to put the screws on Trump. The end goal is obviously to prevent him from campaigning for 2024 presidential election. We need to teach people, especially the rich people, that you just cannot get away with crimes because you can afford to bribe people. You just cannot rule one of the most powerful countries in the world because you have a lot of money. Like any other human being, he should face the consequences that are brought to him. I do not think that the 34 felony charges are going to stand the test of time against Donald Trump. I think we have seen it so many times in history billionaires always getting away with crimes in the face of the law but also the timing is very suspicious which makes it highly possible that it could be Jordan's administration posing these threats on Trump but like I'm saying I don't think they will go anywhere and we just saw him he pleaded not guilty in court uh, the US Congress doesn't like Trump they never did like him during his presidency and I doubt they like him now so there is a chance that they could come up with just anything they can pin on Donald Trump just to see him go to jail. There is that risk. And then with his sexual relationship with the porn star, well, first of all, the question that should be asked is, is it illegal to have any relations with a porn star or anybody for that matter? The reaction of some South Africans to the 34-count indictment and arraignment of former U.S. President Donald Trump. The South African government on Wednesday terminated the national state of disaster announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa in early February. The declaration was intended to deal with the worst electricity crisis the country has ever seen. Kit Bartley reports from Johannesburg. The government said the state of disaster had been a necessary response to the power crisis, but that since then a number of measures had been put into place to deal with the constant shortages and daily scheduled blackouts known here as load shedding. Among them was the appointment of a minister of electricity, Kokshencho Ramagopa, who has undertaken visits to struggling power stations and met with executives at embattled state power utility ESCOM, 
The Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Tembi Nakedameng, told a press conference. So as we move forward, government will, through the Energy Crisis Committee, of course led by the Minister, continue to engage, cooperate, coordinate all actions to reduce and eradicate load shedding using existing legislation and contingency arrangements. Load shedding, however, continued Wednesday, even as the state of disaster was revoked, with stage four, or at least five hours a day of power cuts, in place. The cuts meant to reduce pressure on the overstretched electric grid, with its many aging and badly maintained coal-fired power stations regularly breaking down, have hit Africa's most industrialized economy hard. ESCOM CEO Andre de Reuter left the job earlier this year after giving an explosive interview accusing high-level government officials of corruption. De Reuter said he was unable to turn the graft-riddled and heavily indebted utility around and alleged there had been a poisoning attempt on his life. There had been concerns the state of disaster, which did away with some of the bureaucracy surrounding energy procurement, could allow for further corruption. A non-governmental organization and a trade union had filed lawsuits challenging the state of disaster. Last week, Finance Minister Enoch Godengwana announced ESCOM would be exempted from declaring all its expenditures. On Wednesday, after widespread criticism, he backtracked, withdrawing that exemption. President Cyril Ramaphosa has said there is no quick fix for the crisis, over which South African opposition parties have staged protests as the public becomes more and more frustrated. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. Senegal's opposition says it is open for dialogue with President Macky Sall, but it says the president must put on the table the topics for the talks. This after the president said in a pre-independence day speech this week that he was open to dialogue in the interest of peace. Mamandou Lamini Diallo is an opposition member of Senegal's parliament. He tells me the opposition has two conditions for talks, that the government should stop harassing the opposition and that President Sal emphatically declares that he will not seek a third term. Of course, in his speech um, before the Independence Day, which is, as we said here, uh, some kind of Republican speech, he mentioned at the end of the speech that he's open for a dialogue with a civil society. He didn't mention dialogue with the opposition as such. However, we can admit that uh, he may include in the dialogue the opposition. But, uh, I mean, from there, we didn't see uh, any any signal from him to open that dialogue. The people, in particular, uh, the militants of PASTEF are still in jail. Some are arrested, and uh, that's the situation today. And then I will see in the coming hours or in the coming days what kind of step he will put on the table for that dialogue. That's our position today. Even... The most violent war finished into dialogue. So on principle, the opposition cannot say that they is opposed to any dialogue with Makisa. Of course, but you have some conditions for, for that dialogue. So you say you are open for dialogue, but uh, you have some conditions. What would they be? Well, there are two set of conditions that now we are expected in the side of this opposition, which may be difficult for him. Number one is for him to stop the policy of harassing and for trying, as he said himself, that he will reduce the opposition to zero. Condition number two is for him to make clear now that he will not run for the third term because everybody knows that it was the main issue for the referendum we had in 2016. That referendum was to solve definitely very clearly for everybody and for the future that in Senegal we will now be like in the United States. When the president has done two mandates, it's finished for him. And we all agree on that position. And that's why in 2011 we were against President Abdullah Wahad and Macky Sall was part of that struggle. It was clear for everybody that he cannot run for the third term. And then condition number two is that Macky Sall made very clearly to everybody, even in his own party and his own coalition, that he will not run for the third term. If those conditions are on the table, then I think dialogue will be very easy.
and will be open, and then we, we can find solutions, and, and then the Senegal will be in peace and stability. It seems the, the president, I think President Macky Sall now this week said that he might not run for a third term, but he has also said that his uh, first term was not a part of the law that limited him from um, running. In other words, he was just trying to complete his term. Can he do that? Well, it's the same ambiguity is saying that yes or no. And he did not make clear yet that he will not run for the third term. Mamandou Lamini Diallo is an opposition member of Senegal's parliament. He was speaking with us from the Senegalese capital, Dakar. <music> You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I am James Butte in Washington. Today is Thursday, April 6. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Eligible voters in Liberia are calling for an extension of the first phase of the voter registration process. The National Elections Commission, also known as NEC, has adopted biometric voter registration, or BVR, for the country's October 10 polls. But voters have been reporting irregularities with the new technology. The exercise, which kicked off in the first six months on March 20th, is expected to end on April 9th. Now, voters want an extension to ensure that they can register. Rita Jilabwe Duo has details from Monrovia. According to the National Elections Commission, or NEC, the ongoing biometric voter registration exercise is intended to reduce the processing time of registrants, eliminate voter fraud, and ensure easy cleaning of the voters' roll. However, voters say the process has been made by flaws, including an insufficient workforce and materials, as well as malfunctioning equipment. Scores of voters say they leave their homes before dawn to queue up at registration centers, but they still have not been able to complete the process. From yesterday, two o'clock, I came here. It's been a whole day here yesterday for me to go in. They say computer score. So they took our names on food yesterday. Since today again, I came here around five. we here. It is my right, but I'm busy now. I came here three days. I can't say I won't up the power, but I can get it cut. I'm not getting any money at King here. So I feel it bad. I even want to leave from here and go stay down. If I don't go, no problem. As a way of solving the problem, people say the neck should extend the deadline or create additional centers to fast track the process. There should be time added to this registration time in order for everybody to register. Other than that, you will see majority of the people will not be able to register from what we can see at the various centers. Within the man by this era, I think the next council will think about opening another center here because this center is overcrowded and then they need to think about extending the time. Joseph Boaka is the standard bearer of the opposition unity party and former vice president. He has also underscored the need for an extension of vote registration at a ceremony organized by NEC for political leaders in the country to commit to non-violent, free and fair elections. Bwaka emphasized transparency in the registration process as a key element to having a violence-free election. As we plan our signatures to the Farmington River Declaration that will commit us to a non-violent, free fair and transparent legislative and presidential election, we call on the National Election Commission to consider extending the registration process in the first six counties. This is intended to make sure and make up for the delays and technical problems that have led to the many not being able to register. Not doing so will be an act of deliberate disenfranchising Liberians citizens from participating in the election. The next chairperson, David Etta Brown-Lansana, acknowledges reports of challenges in registering, but says the commission will continue the exercise as planned, at least for the first phase of the process. There will be no extension of voter registration in phase one. Making an extension also to the process will carry us deep into our next phase, 
because there's a transition between phase one and phase two. If we lose that time because of extending uh, voter registration in phase one, this will not go well for the process in phase two. Before the start of voter registration in March, the National Elections Commission denounced a drastic reduction in its proposed budget from 91 million U.S. dollars to U.S. 53 million dollars. The commission announced that the budget cut would affect major activities leading to the October 10 polls. Rita Jabwe-Duo for VOA Monrovia. In Zambia, a former deputy secretary of the opposition Patriotic Front Party, Mombi Piri, was released from prison yesterday where she had been serving time while awaiting trial for murder along with former President Edgar Longu's barber. But before the judge could render his decision, the state prosecutor entered a nolly prosequi, a legal term that simply means that the government decided to stop the prosecution. Makebe Zulu, the lawyer for Mombi Piri, says he intends to sue the state for malicious prosecution and false imprisonment. Today happened to be the day for the judgment. After the state opened their case, closed their case, as the defense, we opened ours and closed it. So today we're expecting the judge to render his judgment in relation to the fate of Mombi Piri, having been charged for the murder of one Lawrence Lander. But before the judge could uh, get started reading the judgment, the state entered what is called a nolle prosequi, that is uh, not pro- proceeding with prosecution. Right? They stopped the prosecution for Mumbi Piri and uh, decided that they'd go ahead with the judgment for the other the co accused. At that point, the nature of the law in Zambia is such that when the TPP, that's the Director of Public Prosecution, enters what is known as a northern prosecutor. They simply inform the court. The court can't say no, and uh, no one can challenge that aspect. So the, the judge went ahead and uh, discharged me the period. Now, a northern prosecutor is not an acquittal. It's simply stating that the state is not proceeding with the prosecution in that particular matter. As you said, the Nolly Prosequi is not an acquittal, but we are talking about a murder allegation. What do you plan to do next? Is she free for good? Well, in this particular case, she's free for good because, well, another person has been convicted of the murder in this particular case. So she is free for good. And that conviction does not say that this person was acting together with another person. Over and above that, what we intend to do is certainly we have to sue the state for malicious prosecution and false imprisonment. In this particular case, notwithstanding that she's not been acquitted, the very fact that she had to undergo this ordeal and the state itself chooses not to proceed, she deserves some recompense, uh, recompense for the period that she stayed in custody. Yes, we will be uh, pursuing that option. She is an important uh, official in your party. I mean, do you think uh, this was a retribution because we you had a change in government? It has all the fingerprints of retribution because ordinarily in the first place they should not have arrested her because all the evidence right from the start of the case suggested that she was not party to anything that related to the matter. So you are saying that your party, or on behalf of Ms. Peary, you are going to file for some uh, damages, is that correct? Yes, we will go we far for damages for the time that she spent in prison. Makibi Zulu is the lawyer for Mombi Piri, former deputy secretary of Zambia's main opposition patriotic front party. He was speaking with us from Lusaka. Some South Sudanese traders and economists are calling on the government to set up a regulatory body that can help control the fluctuating exchange rate of South Sudan's pounds to the U.S. dollar. The country's Auditor General, Stephen Wondu, blames the Central Bank of South Sudan for what he calls inadequate supervision of foreign exchange rates. For VOA News, Juliana Shipai has more from Juba. South Sudan's Auditor General Stephen Wondu says the unpredictable exchange rates of the U.S. dollars to South Sudanese pound dates back to an audit report he submitted to the Central Bank of South Sudan in 2013. He says the report had good recommendations. Wondu says the Bank of South Sudan is not keen on supervising foreign exchange rates at commercial banks. 
we have consistently found out that the Bank of South Sudan supervisory activity is not adequate. The Bank of South Sudan has not been able to supervise the commercial banks in terms of where the foreign exchange that is given to the commercial banks is utilized. Neither is the Bank of South Sudan really having adequate control of its own currency unit. We have cases about mismanagement of currency in the central bank. So the foreign currency that is auctioned and given to the forex bureau and the commercial banks does not translate into imported goods at that exchange rate. Wondu added that once a foreign currency finds itself in the black market, prices of basic commodities could shoot up due to the cost incurred during imports. Yosa Otoha is a trader at Libya market in Juba. He says the government of South Sudan is doing very little to control the exchange rate of South Sudanese pound to the U.S. dollars. The government should set a regulatory body that can help in controlling the dollar prices. Maybe uh, we could be talking of uh, a bureau of standard so that they are going to control or they will impose uh, laws that will govern the day-to-day running of the dollars because at the moment everything depends on the black market. Otoha stressed that the government of South Sudan should give foreign currency to forex bureaus at a set exchange rate. He says the uncontrolled skyrocketing dollar exchange rate in South Sudan is not good news to traders who import goods from Kenya, Sudan and Uganda. The official South Sudan government rate stands at one US dollar exchanging for 840 South Sudanese pounds. The parallel market sells one US dollars for 860 South Sudanese pounds. For VOA News, I am Juliana Shiapai. In Juba. Sudan has a rich archaeological history, boasting more pyramids than Egypt. At the University of Khartoum, women archaeologists are set to dominate the field, with more than 90% of archaeologist students now female. Henry Wilkins reports from Khartoum, Sudan. While Egypt might be the first place that springs to mind when it comes to pyramids, follow the Nile River further south to Sudan and you'll discover Meroe. They're arguably Sudan's most important archaeological treasure and now female archaeologists are set to take the reins of studying them. Lina Hatem Ahmed is an archaeology student at the University of Khartoum. In Africa and in Sudan, people are not aware of the importance of archaeology. Studying it is fun. We're enthusiastic about it, and it makes up a part of a rounded education. Archaeology subfields, too, help us develop a view of the world. Yahya Fadil Daha leads the university's archaeology department, where 27 of 30 students are women. Women, he notes, often score higher in entrance exams. The majority of students are females. Historically, women have always been a part of Sudanese life, and just like they were during the Meroitic civilization, they are participating in our civilization today. So we have a long history that women are uh, their freedom and they are participating in the, in the society. According to the UN, Sudanese women suffer multiple forms of discrimination and inequality. Some female students say they have had to overcome preconceived notions of gender roles to get into archaeology. I meet some people that don't support my studies and keep telling me that this is against our traditions and religious beliefs. For example, they say, how can you travel to exhume bodies? So objections come from a lack of understanding. Nonetheless, she hopes to continue her studies and become an archaeological tour guide so she can play a part in introducing Sudan's rich history to more people. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Khartoum, Sudan. The charity group Doctors Without Borders says it has rescued 440 migrants from an overcrowded fishing boat in the waters of Malta. It says migrants saved by the overnight mission, which took 11 hours in stormy seas, are now on board its boat, the Geo Barons. Reuters said another organization, Alarm Phone, picked up distress calls from the vessel two days ago. The passengers spent four days at sea without food or water after setting off from eastern Libya near Benghazi on April 1st. And that's it for this Thursday, April 6th edition of Daybreak Africa.